They say that imitation is the most sincere form of flattery, and I'm not 100% sure I believe that all the time, but in this case, I can tell you it's 100% true. So, a couple months ago, I was scrolling through Instagram, I saw on Mike Pekovich's feed, he did a class with a student by the name of Sean Montague, and together they built a cabinet that I absolutely adored. Turns out, it was heavily inspired by the work of Philip Morley. So, I happened to follow Philip on Instagram, and I saw some of the details for previous projects he's done, and I decided I would incorporate those into this build. So, thank you, all you guys, for your inspiration, but most importantly, Philip, um, your work is amazing, man, and I'm just uh, I'm glad you're allowing me to steal your ideas. All right, so here it is, the Media Credenza, made from walnut. The doors are a book-matched crotch walnut. Um, some really cool techniques we'll get into with that. The doors are not hinged, they're just sliding doors. So easy to make, and there's no metal hardware at all here, but look how smooth these slide. So, we've got three compartments, each of them is fully ventilated, there's holes for cords to go through, there's actually uh, interconnecting holes so you can send cords from one compartment to the next. And I gotta tell you, for me, I'm not putting a lot of gear in this thing. Most of my gear is very lightweight and doesn't really produce a lot of heat, so I'll be okay with this. If you are putting some heavy duty gear in something like this, you may wanna ventilate a little bit more aggressively with active ventilation. Uh, but here we go, it's gonna be a really big build. We're gonna make some mistakes. My brother-in-law, Jason, is helping me. This is the first project we've done from start to finish together. And I gotta tell you, the process of, of teaching someone else, being responsible for their safety, and making sure they're learning along the way as we build and film, means that I just made some stupid mistakes. I just forgot things and wasn't as careful as I usually am. So you're gonna see me make those mistakes, and then you're gonna see me fix those mistakes. All right, so it's a big build. Let's get into it. We're gonna start by making the case panels, including the sides, the partitions, the top, and the bottom. We're doing our best to match up the grain, but that can be pretty tricky with walnut. But guess what? Paying any attention at all to grain matching will likely put your work ahead of about 90% of what's out there. Just make the effort. Everything is cut oversized in length. Most of the panels will be a glue up of three boards, so I lay them out and define the areas that I want to remove, and then check and see if we still have enough width. Now we'll mill the boards four square in preparation for glue up. I'm actually using five quarter stock for this project, but you can absolutely get away with four quarter if you want to. Five quarter is nice because the parts are just beefier, and for longer pieces you don't have to worry so much about removing too much stock when you're milling it flat. Because we don't have time to glue up the panels today, we're leaving the parts a little bit oversized and letting them sit until we're back in the shop. This way if the boards move while they acclimate, we'll be able to mill them flat before the panel glue up. Fortunately, when we came back, the boards were still nice and flat. But I'll give them one more pass on the jointer and then through the planer before gluing up the panels. For walnut, I like to use Type-On 3. Not really because it's a waterproof glue, but because the glue line dries pretty dark and makes for a less noticeable glue line. Once the glue is dry, I'll rough sand the panels and put them aside while I work on the top and the bottom. Now these boards are more than 8 inches wide, and I really don't want to cut them down just to fit them on my jointer, so I'll employ a little trick that'll allow me to keep the boards at full width. I'll temporarily remove the guard on the jointer, giving additional room for the excess to hang off the edge. We can then joint an 8 inch wide section of the board so that it's nice and flat. The board is then flipped over, and using double stick tape we can attach a piece of scrap plywood that's just about the same dimensions as the jointed area of the board. With the ply pressed up against the little lip, we can apply pressure and then head to the planer. Now with the plywood face down, we could pass the board through the planer to get a nice, clean, flat, and parallel face. To finish milling the board, we'll flip it over, remove the plywood, and then send it back through the planer again to clean up the remaining high material on the other face. While it's generally not a good idea to remove a safety device from any tool, this is one instance where I consider it justified. Just be careful to make sure you replace that guard immediately when you're done. Because the top and bottom are pretty long, I'll use dominoes to help keep the boards aligned during the glue up. This isn't a necessity by any means, but it does help the glue up go a little bit more smoothly. And I likes it smooth. Okay, 
I also like to run a set of clamps in the opposite orientation to help keep the pressure balanced. I find that this helps the panels stay flat after the glue up. When the glue dries, the surface is rough sanded and the panels are trimmed to final width. The MFT is a nice tool for not only trimming the boards to length, but also making sure that the ends are square. A large framing square and some sort of guide for your circular saw is a good alternative. Using my drawings for reference, I'll begin marking the locations of the dados and grooves on the top and bottom. Because walnut is so dark, I'll use a white pencil to reinforce the start and stop points for the dados. That'll make it easier to see when I'm routing. All the joinery will be cut using the router and a half inch bit. To cut the inside dados, I'll line up the bit with my marks and then cut a piece of scrap ply to match the distance from the edge of the board to the router base. Now I can clamp this scrap in place so that it's flush with the ends and use the other edge as a fence for the dado cuts. Remember, these are stop dados, so be sure to watch those layout lines. We have three more of these to do. For the dados on the ends, I'll just use the router's edge guide. Now for the sliding door groove, the bottom groove is really shallow at about a sixteenth of an inch. The top is a little deeper at three eighths. Next up, we'll cut the partition and side panels down to length and width at the table saw. Each panel gets a wide tenon along the top and bottom edges, and I'll scribe across the grain to not only mark the locations of the shoulder, but to help prevent tear out. Now I'll use a sacrificial fence to bury the dado blade just slightly, allowing me to make the rabbit cuts on the ends of each board. With a cut on each face, the end result is the wide tenon that we need to fit into our dado. Now the ends of this tenon need to be notched so that they accommodate the fact that the dado is a stop dado. Magnetic stops are super handy for stuff like this. With a nice sharp chisel, it's pretty easy to use the main part of the shoulder as a reference allowing us to kind of slice the high stuff away. Because the dados were made with a router bit, the ends are rounded, so I'll quickly round the ends of the tenon to match. I generally size my joinery slightly thick so that I could sneak up on the final fit using hand tools. So just a pass or two with the shoulder plane, and these tenons fit like a glove. At the front of our case, the partitions need to sit back about a sixteenth of an inch behind the sliding door groove so that they don't interfere with the sliding action. All of the partitions and sides are processed in the same way, and when I'm done, I number each one so that I could reassemble them in this exact order. Now with the top and bottom in place, we can really evaluate the fit and plan our next move, which is the back panel groove. This groove goes around the inner perimeter, so I need to cut the groove in the side panels as well as the top and bottom. A quarter inch bit and an edge guide does the trick. Next, I want to add a bull nose profile to the top and the bottom. I don't actually have a proper bull nose bit, so I'm just taking two passes with a large roundover. The bull nose is added to the side edges and the front, but not the back. The back stays square. Since the bit doesn't actually give me a perfect bull nose, I'll try to finesse it a little bit at the workbench. I could then smooth the back edge with my jack plane. Once again, we can dry fit the case in order to measure for the quarter inch back panel. The back panel is made from quarter inch walnut plywood. We'll test the fit before moving on. If all the joints close, we're good to go. Now to allow for some ventilation, I cut a few slots in the back panel near the top. These are just cut with a 3 8 inch router bit and an edge guide. And this is something you can have fun with, make a design that looks interesting. Now I mentioned this at the beginning, but it bears repeating. If you have heat producing gear in an enclosed space, you might need to consider more substantial ventilation. 
At the bottom of each compartment, we'll use a Forstner bit to drill a large hole that's big enough for plugs to pass through. And on the partitions, we'll cut a semicircle that allows the passing through of plugs and wires between each internal compartment. Now we'll prep for finish by sanding all the panels to 180 grit. We have a lot more work to do, but it makes so much sense to apply the finish right now before we do the glue up. Those inside corners would just be a pain in the butt. So I'll apply the finish, taking care to avoid getting it in the dados or on the tenons. The finish here is Osmo Pollux Oil Pure. For a little more detail on how to apply this finish, check out the video I did on the round red oak tabletop. Once the finish is cured, it's time for the glue up. I'll use 2x4s with tape on the edge as a platform to lift the assembly up off the bench. This is going to make it a lot easier to apply our clamps. Because I know this one's going to require a lot of fiddling, I'm using Titebond's liquid hide glue. It gives me a lot more working time. While we're watching this assembly, I wanted to take a minute to tell you about my new book, Essential Joinery. It's 216 pages of big pictures and step-by-step -step instructions on how to make what I consider to be the most essential joints in woodworking. And I'll show you multiple methods to make each joint using various tools. The book is published by Springhouse Press and is available at major retailers like Amazon and Barnes & Noble. And if you want a signed copy, you can buy one directly from me at EssentialJoinery.com. If you're just getting started in woodworking or maybe just want to up your joinery game, I would love it if you bought a copy of Essential Joinery. Let's get back to the build. When applying the clamping pressure, we'll use rags to help prevent marring the finished surface. The ends are pretty easy to clamp since we can get pressure all the way across the joint, but in the center, it's kind of impossible to get clamping pressure in the middle of those partitions. So I'll use a couple of sets of cambered calls to put pressure where it needs to be. The calls are intentionally bowed in such a way that by the time we flatten out the call, there's already a substantial amount of pressure right at the center, and that lets us clamp across the entire joint with only two clamps. Of course, as always, we check for square before leaving the assembly overnight. Now we can start on the base, beginning with these cute little feet. We'll use 12 quarter stock to avoid having a glue line in each foot. The pieces are cut square, jointed, and planed and then cut to length. We actually cut a few extra just in case. Now whenever you make legs or feet, don't just arrange them randomly. Try to seek out rifts on grain where the grain of all the legs will go toward the center. This will give a much more consistent look to our feet and when we cut the curves, the grain will actually appear to follow the curve. Once we have the orientation we want, we can roughly mark the mortise locations so that we don't get them mixed up. I'll lay out the mortises on each foot, or at least the start and stop points. We'll use the hollow chisel mortiser to make the mortises. I don't really use this tool that often, but in this case, given how small the feet are, this tool cuts the mortises quickly and safely. It's perfect for the job. I actually have a video on setting up a hollow chisel mortiser that you might be interested in checking out. Now for the base rails. I'm trying my best to pick grain that follows the specific curve that we're gonna cut into the rails. It's not easy. I found one great section for the front rail, that's really the most important, but the rest are just okay. I really don't wanna to have to get another eight quarter board, so we'll make do with what we have. The parts are rough cut with the jigsaw and bandsaw, and then jointed and plain to the final dimension. The long rails will be cut to length at the chop saw. The short rails are cut to length, but spoiler alert, they're being cut to the wrong length. I'm not going to say that it's Jason's fault because uh, those are his hands and those are definitely his tattoos, but I'm kind of in charge here and I should be double checking everything that the new guy does, but I didn't, so stay tuned for more on that. Now for some tenons. 
I'll draw the full tenon onto at least one of the rail ends so that I can get the tools set up. I'll be using the dado stack with a sled at the table saw. We'll start with the test cut and make adjustments from there. Once the tenon just starts to go in, I'll keep that setting and cut the rest of the tenons. Now for the bottom short shoulder, I'll lower the blade. The top shoulder is just too much for the blade size that we have, so I'll cut what I can and then switch back to a single blade to nibble away the rest of the stock. Any material left over on the shoulder can be chiseled away, and the width of the tenon can be finessed to the perfect fit. Of course, we do have eight total tenons to finesse, but I'll save you the trouble of watching all of that. For the feet, I'm going to make up a little template based on what looks good to my eye. There will be an outside curve for the front faces of the feet and a small inner curve for the inside faces. The shape is applied to the two outside faces of the leg blank. Before making any cuts, bring all four feet together just for a little bit of a sanity check. There's probably several ways to get this done, but I like to start by cutting both curves on one face, then taping the off cuts back onto the blank to cut the other face. At this point, there's really no more flat reference surfaces to work with, so I'll finesse the feet at the spindle sander just by holding it up and applying pressure, then checking my progress repeatedly. At the workbench, I'll finish sanding the feet, including all of the curves and flats. Now I can dry assemble the feet and rails. The rails have a very interesting profile to them that starts by matching the profile of the feet. So I'll measure the reveal and mark that distance at the top of the rail leaving a little bit of extra meat there to allow for the curvature. I'll draw on the shoulder of the rail to help visualize the cut that I need to make. With the bevel gauge set to the angle, I can then set the saw to the bevel gauge. Now we can cut the bevels on all four rails. Using a hand plane, I'll shape the rails by eye, trying to achieve the same profile that we have on the feet. Once I'm close, I sand the surface to kind of blend it all in and then check my progress against the foot. All of the rails get this exact same profile, but if you want the truth, they're not all going to be exactly the same. Thankfully, the human eye isn't really great at spotting tiny differences in curved surfaces and profiles, so even if they're not exactly the same, no one's ever going to know. With the feet and rails assembled again, I'll mark a line where the curve at the foot stops. That's the point that our rail curve needs to begin. It slopes downward to the center and then back up again to the other foot. A Lee Valley drawing bow is perfect for the short rails, but the long rails require a shop-made solution. Using a strip of quarter-inch MDF and some blocks and clamps, I could flex the strip to get the curve that I need. The curves are then cut at the bandsaw and smoothed at the spindle sander. All of the parts get a round over and a nice finish sanding to 180 grit. To assemble the base, I'll start by gluing up the short rails first. I'll use the cutoffs from the feet with some cork added to the face as calls, and that'll match the curve perfectly for our feet. This allows the clamp to engage with a nice flat surface while still applying pressure across a kind of a wacky shaped joint. If there's any discrepancy where the underside curve meets the foot, I'll chisel and sand the area until the surfaces meet cleanly. While the glue is drying, I'm going to make some cleats that we'll use to hold the base to the case. 
I'll drill the holes and then angle the bit back and forth to create slots that will accommodate some wood movement. The cleats will then be glued to the inside of the rails. Now I can glue on the long rails. Now it's time for some more finish. You just gotta love the dramatic change that walnut experiences once you hit it with a beautiful finish. At this point, we let the finish dry overnight. The next day, I decided to put the base on the case only to discover a problem. A big problem. A big, 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 big problem. The short rails were cut too long, and the base is now three inches too big. After about 45 minutes of this, I put on my fixer hat and decided on a reasonable strategy to salvage the base. You ready? I start by marking the center line and then measuring out in each direction to establish the correct rail length. There's plenty of room to spare here, so I'll get out a handsaw and do the unthinkable. I saw right through the side rails. The remaining rail stock that's stuck to the foot is chiseled and sawn away. I decided the easiest thing to do here is to leave the tenon in place as a built-in patch. In order to rework the rails, I need a flat surface, so I saw off the cleat as close to the inside edge as I can and plan to reuse this cleat. The inside face of the rails is then planed, scraped, and sanded smooth. At the chop saw, I'll carefully remeasure and mark my lines and cut the rails to length. For the new joinery, I'm going to rely on the domino to bail me out, but as great as the domino is, this process won't be foolproof. I first need to accurately locate the mortises on both the feet and the ends of the rails. Because the foot is all goofy shaped and small, I'm going to have to cobble together some sort of fence to accurately register the domino. Even then, the domino feels a little bit wobbly, so I'm doing my best to keep the domino straight which is hard to do through the constant stream of angry, stinging tears falling out of my eyes. Fortunately, the mortise in the rails is a breeze because we've got a flat and square surface to work with. With the rails and feet assembled again, I'll repeat the process of laying out and cutting the bottom curve. And now I can glue the frame back together you know it happened, I know it happened, but for anyone who hasn't seen this video, the fix is totally undetectable. After the glue dried, I applied finish where it was needed, and then attached the base to the case. Well, that was fun. You know, people always tell me that the mark of a good craftsman is his ability to fix his mistakes. That sounds great on a Facebook meme, but in reality, it's BS. Great craftsmen work hard to limit their mistakes as much as possible, and the better they get, the fewer mistakes they make. But when a mistake does happen, the fixing of the mistake becomes an entirely new discipline of problem solving, and it pays to get good at that too. But it's always better to not make the mistake in the first place. The credenza has three adjustable shelves, so we glued up a few panels and then cut them to width. A few holes are drilled in each compartment. And by the way, if you do adjustable shelving like this, don't make your cabinets swish cheese. Pick the most common locations and add a few options. You don't need to go nuts. And man, does my hair look gray in this shot. No wonder I'm getting offers for hair dye sponsors. The shelves are dropped in place, and I notice that they look a little bit thick. Again, I'm using five quarter stock for this. Now, I don't want to sacrifice thickness, so to make them appear thinner, I put a shallow bevel at the front. Now we can start working on the raised panel doors. I'm selecting grain for the frames that's pretty straight and boring. I really want the panels to be the thing that catches your eye. The parts are all cut and milled four square. For the panel stock, I'm looking for some nice crotch. To try to keep the crotch centered, I'll draw a center line through the knot and then measure above and below to ensure that we get the whole crotch, not just part of the crotch. I'm pretty lucky to have two fairly large crotches, and both are similarly impressive. Okay, I got that out of my system. 
Now each board is resawn in half and the book match will make up a single panel for each door. To help stabilize the boards, I'll fill any major cracks with epoxy. Once dry, I'll sand the epoxy down and then begin to joint and plane all of the door stock together. The boards can then be glued together to make up the panels. While those dry, we can finish milling the door frame parts to size. At the router table, I'll use a slot cutting bit to create a slot in a piece of scrap. I don't want to put the slots into door frames just yet because we've got some shaping to do, so this is only for the sake of setting up for the tenon cuts. To make the tenons, we'll scribe the shoulders first. Then using the dado stack at the table saw, we can cut the tenon and test the fit. I don't show it here, but I'm using the test piece that we just cut to make sure that the tenon fits perfectly. The top rail of the door receives a little curve. The panel also gets a complementary curve, so when I draw this curve, I'm going to save both pieces and that'll give me two templates. After smoothing the edges, the two curves won't be dead on as a match, but they'll be close enough for what we need to do. Now I can trace the rail shape onto the top rails and then cut them at the bandsaw. The curve is then smoothed with a flexible sanding strip. Now back at the router table, we can use a slot cutting bit to cut the groove on the inside of all of the door frame parts. For the straight parts, I'll use the fence for some extra support. On the curved parts, I'll get what I can with the fence in place and then I'll do the rest without the fence there. Router tables usually come with a pivot pin that makes cuts like this a lot safer, but I honestly couldn't find mine, so I'm kind of setting a bit of a bad example here. If you have one, use it. Thankfully, the cut went well, and a test fit of the frames looks pretty good. So let's jump back to those panels. I'll cut the panels to final size at the table saw. The panels will receive a raised profile, and I'm going to run a test board just to confirm the setup. That looks pretty good, so now I can route the panels. Remember, I mentioned at the beginning about being a little bit distracted by having a new helper in the shop. Well, here's another place where it rears its ugly head. I forgot to cut the curve in the panels. No problem, I'll just cut the curve now and then redo the raised profile. Making the raised profile on a curved face is a little bit weird, but if you take your time and you keep the board against the bearing at all times, it's not too bad. On the back side of the panels, I'll cut a small rabbit that thins the perimeter down so that it fits into that frame groove that we cut. Now for the curved portion at the top, we use a slot cutting bit to cut that rabbit. If the rabbit's just a little bit snug, we can use a shoulder plane to finesse the fit. With the bottom rail in place, you can see how the panel is just a bit narrower. This is to allow for movement when it's locked in the frame. The panels are now sanded thoroughly, giving extra love to the end grain at the top and the bottom. I like to sand with the grain and to a higher grit than the rest of the panel. This helps prevent the end grain from getting really dark when it's hit with finish. The rails are all sanded on the edges and the corners are eased with sandpaper. Before assembly, I'll wipe some finish on the perimeter of the panel. This helps ensure that we don't see any bare wood if the panel decides to shrink. Time for the glue up. Now I'm using hide glue again for some extra working time. We put plenty of glue on the tenons and in the groove area that accepts the tenon. And while the panel just floats for the most part, there's no harm in putting a dab of glue at the very center, assuming there's room on both sides for the panel to move. Joints like this don't require tons of pressure, just enough to close up the gaps. After the glue dries, we'll sand the frame to remove the glue and remove any remaining mill marks. Now the sliding doors require a little bit of fiddling to get them to work properly. I highly recommend making a test piece from scrap. This will help confirm the total height of the doors as well as the dimensions of the rabbits on both ends. The bottom of the door gets a very shallow rabbit and the top gets a deeper one. When cut just right, the doors will pivot in, push up, and then drop down into the groove. When the doors are installed, I push them all the way to each side to see if I need to finesse anything. Looks like I've got a slight gap at the top on the left, so I'll use a hand plane to make a slight taper so that that gap disappears. And now, more finish. 
This, however, is the most exciting part as we get to see that crotch grain come to life. You know, some people see an owl, some people see a dragon. I see a dead tree. After the finish dries, I'll drop in the doors, sit back, and appreciate this amazing walnut. From our friends at Austin Hardwoods in Denver, Colorado. So here it is, the Media Credenza. Super fun project, a lot more challenging than I actually anticipated, and it was a good learning experience for me. So I hope you enjoyed watching the process and uh, the project go together, and we will have at least a SketchUp drawing and a, a basic set of plans for you if you wanna build something similar. All right, thanks for watching, everybody. Take care. Cool.